Uh, our next presenter is Matt Wade, a professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He is also the founder of the nation's first drone journalism lab in a, in a uh, university, and uh, also re the, re the recipient of, I, we believe, the first uh, grant from Knight Foundation for uh, drone journalism. And I see Jose out there nodding, uh, nodding knowingly about that grant. I also want to both recognize and thank uh, another of our partners in this uh, conference, Univision, uh, represented here today by Jose Zamora. Um, so Matt will be talking to us about drone journalism. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matt. So um, I want to start just a quick show of hands because I think this is a this is an interesting time to sort of gauge where we're at. How many of you are at organizations that either have a drone or how many of you have flown a drone before? Yeah, that's that's interesting. The way that I've charted this. Um, to give you, well, let me, let me take you one step back and then I'll, I'll tell you how, this, how weird this is, because it's all weird. Um, I, came, I went into Gary's office. Gary was the dean at the College of Journalism, and, I, and we had been talking about areas that we could move into and sort of strategic things, and I said, hey, this is 2011. And I said, I just got back from a conference a little while ago, and people could have their own flying robot. And we could put cameras on those flying robots and we could do really amazing things. And I think this is gonna be a really big deal in journalism. And Gary was like, hold on. You mean we could have our own drones? Like we have our own flying things. Yeah, yeah, like this is coming. And I think we could get out ahead of it a little bit. He's like, all right, let's do this. I'm like, well, hold the phone. You do realize after I walk out of your office, I'm going to hand students flying lawnmowers. You're okay with this? And I think he said something effective, don't make me think too much longer about it or I will say no. So I ran out of his office, went home, put up a website that said, hey, we're going to start this thing uh, and we're going to study this stuff. Put it online. Next morning, I got on a plane, went to Phoenix. Jose Zamora was there, basically greeted me at the door said, let's talk. And about 10 minutes later, um, Raju Narsetti was here earlier. He was at the Washington Post at the time. Uh, he said, I want you to talk to a reporter. We're going to do a story about you. And I'm like, hold on. Like, we just started. Like, I don't even know what I'm talking about yet. Um, and later on that day, I had to give a presentation on drone journalism, as if I knew something about it, as if anybody knew anything about it at that point. From that point on, started traveling with drones and I started getting patted down at like every single airport checkpoint I ever went through. And, and in 2011, 2012, 2013, every time I went through TSA, they were like, what is that? We need to, you need to unpack the bag. What is that? What is that? And they would question me and pat me down and uh, all of that. 14, 15, 16. Now when I go through TSA and I've got a drone with me, they pull me out of the line and ask me, hey, um, I'm going to get my kid one of these for Christmas. Which, which one should I buy? Like, what, which one's that? How much does that cost? I have been delayed at more security checkpoints to answer Christmas shopping questions in the last couple of years than I have about actual security. So we are now, we've, we've sort of passed the point where these are, uh, this is new, that this is somehow shocking. But where we're at now still is on the dawn of things for newsrooms. What you're seeing are finally the vision being realized, and that is newsrooms are adopting these, they're buying them, they're putting them in the hands of employees, and they're going out and using them. And where we're really seeing this dramatically is in the series of natural disasters that we've had over the last couple of months. This is from Hurricane Harvey. This is the USA Today Network. They have, uh, I believe, 11 drone pilots throughout Gannett now. Um, this photograph is not that high off the ground, is not that technologically sophisticated, but what it took to take it involved no less than a complete revolution within the Federal Aviation Administration. 
In 2011, when I started the drone lab, the FAA had never contemplated seriously the idea of a journalism school wanting to fly drones to report news. They had not contemplated it so significantly that the next year they sent me a cease and desist order. If you have never received a cease and desist order from a federal regulatory agency, I highly encourage it. You will never feel more alive in that moment. You will also wonder what the weather is like at Gitmo at that particular day and hour. Um, but they sent me one. I now have one of a dozen ever issued cease and desist orders. At the time, it scared the crap out of me. Now I wear it around my neck like Flavor Flav wears a clock. I'm proud of it. Um, and what they said was, you're a state institution. You need government permission. OK. What do I need to do to get government permission? Well, you got to fill out some paperwork, and then we'll, we'll give you permission. Well, a little bit of paperwork to the FAA takes a year. During that year, they said, we've changed our mind. Education is not a government function under, uh, under federal aviation rules. Now you've got to be a commercial entity. OK, what do I got to do to become a commercial entity? Well, more paperwork, but also somebody has to be a licensed pilot. Really? Well, guess what I did two years ago? You all should be terrified of the fact that I can fly airplanes if I really want. Um, while I was learning how to fly an airplane, the FAA changed their mind again and said, well, now we're going to change the rules again. You don't need a pilot's license anymore. We're going we're to actually put in real drone rules. And that's where we came to. Something called Part 107, where you can get licensed. I'll talk about that in a second. All of this is past. You have to understand we're talking about years of time going by that the FAA is uncomfortable with the idea of anyone other than engineering schools and licensed pilots flying drones. When the protests at Standing Rock were going on, the FAA put something called a temporary flight restriction in place over that protest. Now, journalists can get permission to fly in a temporary flight restriction. Most of the time, that's news helicopters. Most of the time, it's fairly simple process for news helicopters to get access to those places or be denied fairly quickly. When a journalist asked to use drones at Standing Rock, it took the FAA four months to approve it. And they approved it for a single location. And they said, you can only fly here. And by the time they issued that permission, the protest had moved on a half a mile down the road. It took them four months to approve something that was completely worthless. That was Standing Rock. That was, the, that was just this past winter. This photograph right here was taken in one of the largest temporary flight restrictions issued by the FAA. It covered the entire Houston metro area, covered much of the Gulf Coast. USA Today got permission to take this photo in less than two hours. Less than two hours. By the time uh, the hurricanes in Florida happened, they were issuing permissions to fly in TFRs in less than an hour. I actually watched the USA Today at photo editor fill out the write an email to the FAA saying, hey, we want to fly in these locations at these altitudes, sent it off, was sitting in a, in, a, in a session, we were talking about drones, and I'm watching him get responses from the FAA while he's sitting there. In minutes, minutes. We have gone to, nobody can use them, to, okay, you have to be a licensed pilot to use them, to, okay, you need to take a knowledge test to use them, to, eh, we'll let you use them in a couple of hours. A couple of hours is going to be a really long time soon. The FAA is even moving toward automated systems via mobile. But this photograph, to me, is just emblematic of where we have come to at this point. And it's not the only one. There are all kinds of photographs being taken now in these situations that do what drones do well. And that is put things in context. I have called drones purpose-built context machines. They, they convey scope and scale better than any tool that we have available to us. And you don't even have to be that high in the air. You don't have to be even that good of a pilot. If you can frame a shot, and if you can get a drone 60 to 100 feet in the air, you can create something like this. This is in Puerto Rico. 
If you needed one image to, con to convey the destruction in Puerto Rico, this does a pretty nice job. And if you didn't see it, the guy on the bike here gives you a sense of size and scope. He's tiny compared to everything going on on there. The wildfires in California have been another place. And actually, this is better as, as they say, the moving pictures. I was a writer for a dozen years. I've covered five hurricanes. I've covered tornadoes. I think I'm a volcano and an earthquake away from like the biblical superfecta. Um, I couldn't hope to write a thousand words that does what this eight, nine second looping video does. That's breathtaking to me. And this is what this tool brings to the table for us. Now, a lot of hands went up on who has these things. So the next bits are going to be maybe a little repetitive to some, but it'll be news to others. So what do you got to do? You would be shocked, maybe, by how many phone calls I get, primarily from universities, that say, we ran out and bought three drones, and we've put them in our checkout room. What policies should we have in place for students taking these out? And my answer is, go get them. Put them back in the box. If you haven't thought about this ahead of time, you have no business handing them out. The drone is almost the last thing that you deal with. So to, thought, to, so to use a drone for journalism, first, you have to be FAA licensed. You have to have a Part 107 license. You get visual item number two. You get another one of these things. You know what? You're asking me, well, hold on. Didn't you just hold that out? Well, yeah, they look exactly the same. If you want to know, what the F, you want to know how the FAA feels about manned aviation versus drone aviation, this is my Part 107 license. This is my manned aviation license. On the front, they look exactly the same. On the back, drones get nothing. The man license gets Orville and Wilbur Wright. So it's like they're saying, yo, drones, you've got no history. You've got nothing. So you've got to get one of those. You have to be licensed. If you're a professional, you have insurance. You wouldn't send somebody out in a car uninsured. You shouldn't send out drone pilots without insurance. If you are hiring somebody else, Get a certificate of insurance from them. One, it lets you know that they have it. And two, it lets you know that they're doing things above board. Third thing is you need written policies. One of my favorite lines from Mythbusters is, is the difference between science and screwing around is writing things down. Mm -hmm. Professionals have written policies. After you have those things, OK. Now you can start talking about equipment. Now you can start nerding out about what you've got. Getting licensed. Honest to goodness, faculty in the room, if you want students to use these, it's just better to get them licensed. There are some narrow windows that students can fly drones without needing an FAA 107 certificate. The problem is they're really narrow. You can't publish them anywhere visible. If all they do is upload a video to Canvas or Blackboard or whatever you use, OK, fine. The FAA says that's hobby flight. No problem. If you want to put it on campus media, you want to put it on a website, you want to publish it in any way, crosses the line. It's just easier to get them 107 certified. Or for you to get 107 certified, and you've got to be standing there watching everything that gets done. Personally, I have a home life. My wife would put a bullet in the back of my head if I spent all of my time following students around. So I'm getting my students 107 certified. To get certified, you have to take a knowledge test. It's a 60 question multiple choice test. You need a 70% to pass it. Every student I've ever told that to are like, no problem. Hold on. It's not something you can BS your way through. There are no essay questions. It is all very specialized knowledge. 
What I tell my students is, it's not hard, it's just work. You have to work at it. You have to study. I would say there's about a minimum of 40 hours of study time that you need to put into it to pass. Passage rate in the United States right now is at about 92% on that test. It's achievable. It can be done. Um, you'll be asked about airspace. That's the biggest one and it's probably the hardest one for most people is, is airspace. It's a three-dimensional object. There's a lot of rules with a lot of map symbology that you got to understand. Weather, operations, the regulations themselves, safety standards, hazards, all kinds of things like that. There's a bunch of stuff. And the way the FAA asks questions is they layer these things on top of each other. It's not they're going to ask you, what does this map symbol mean? It's at such and such a location, you want to fly to such and such altitude at such and such time in such and such place. What are the three things you need to know in order to be able to do this? And then they make you do it. Not hard, it's work, and it costs you 150 bucks. If you fail it, you can take it again. You gotta wait 14 days, and it'll cost you another 150 bucks. To me, 150 bucks is, all right, I gotta take this a little bit seriously. I don't wanna do this again. So, you don't have to demonstrate flight capability. You'll never have to fly your drone for an FAA uh, testing officer or anything like that. In a lot of other countries around the world, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, Italy, Germany, France, just off the top of my head, uh, UK, all of them require you to demonstrate flight capability. Um, US, you don't. You can become a licensed professional drone pilot without ever having touched a drone. Um, make sense out of that. Go ahead. Uh, I can't. Second thing, insurance. Your newsroom's general liability insurance policy does not cover aircraft. A little bit of trivia for you there. So you're going to have to get an aviation rider or a separate policy. There are some organizations that do on-demand insurance policy. Um, why did it just sip out of my head? Uh, Verifly is the company that does it on-demand. A lot of organizations that I've talked to are using Verifly. It's a, it's a smartphone app. You pull your phone out. You go to your location. You pull up Verifly. You say, I want to fly here for the next 20 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever it is, Verifly kicks you back a quote. It could be eight bucks, 12 bucks, 20 bucks, something like that, which works great when you're out in the middle of a cornfield in Dakin, Nebraska, cultural center of the United States. Um, it's less useful when you're in a TFR, when you're in a place where you have valid permission from the FAA to, FAA to be, but Verifly doesn't know that, and they see a TFR in place, and they're like, nah, we're not going to insure you. You don't want an insurance company making a decision on whether or not you get to do journalism. Um, I'd prefer other people making that decision uh, in my organization. So an aviation policy, you'll never have to call Aon or AIG or anybody like that and say, hey, I want to fly my drone here. They don't care. But it'll cost you more um, over time. If you are interested in insurance, I can talk to you about it later. Uh, it is still early enough in the morning. The coffee may not have completely kicked in. I'm no better than to have insurance conversations, so moving along. Written policies. The FAA is going to expect you to have certain written policies in place, like a maintenance schedule, like uh, emergency procedures, a pre-flight briefing, you should also have policies in your newsroom that dictate when a drone flies and when it doesn't. The most significant piece of information that I think newsroom managers need to know when it comes to drones is this. Under federal law, the pilot in command is the final authority on whether or not a drone flies. If a pilot goes out to a scene, looks at it and goes, there's no way I can conduct this safely, that's it. It's done. It's over. It's not the news director's call. It's not the city editor's call. It's not the photo editor's call. It's the pilot in command. Why? The pilot in command has this. They have the, they have the pilot's license. They're the one the FAA is going to go after. It's their license that gets suspended. I have in my mind's eye envisioned the first wrongful termination lawsuit that involves 
a photo editor or a news director screaming into the phone, get me my goddamn drone shot or you're fired. And that pilot has to make a decision. Lose their job or lose their license. The FAA can fine you up to $10,000 per flight for violating rules. It's fairly rare, rarely ever happens. But yanking somebody's license when something goes wrong, that's absolutely within their purview. It's not the city editor that's going to lose their license. It's not the news director that's going to. You need to have policies in place that spell that out clearly. If you come from a newsroom that has a news helicopter, this is old news. This is something that's been in place for a long time. The news director goes to the helicopter pilot, a four, you know, three to four million dollar aircraft, and they say, we need to go fly somewhere. And they're like, not today, we're not. Weather won't allow it. Can't go in there. It's restricted airspace, something like that. That's it. It's done. They walk away. Find another way. Newsroom managers, I think, don't have the same respect for a drone. They don't recognize it as an aircraft, where the FAA absolutely regulates it as an aircraft. And once you get that certificate, you are a pilot. And you have the rights and responsibilities thereof. So you need to have policy manual in place that emphasizes these things. Good news, we got one. Part of the grant that we got from the Knight Foundation, uh, we produced an operations manual. It is an open source document. It's a Creative Commons licensed. If there is some way possible for you to violate that license, guess what? The Knight Foundation didn't give me money to hire lawyers, so I can't go after you anyway. So just steal it, use it for whatever the hell you want. Uh, I know that this manual is being used uh, at a number of the largest news organizations. I know a number just straight up copied it. I know a number have taken it and built on it. Um, what I would say is our manual is about 90% of what you need to get going. The rest is things that are local to you. How you handle your own law enforcement, how you handle your own uh, fire and rescue folks, how you deal with your own newsroom politics and policies. We have checklists to ensure safety. We have all of, uh, all of what you would need to get started. Steal it, use it, do whatever you want. It's what it's there for. So if I have these things, it's all easy, right? Uh, I hate to tell you, but no. No, no, no. Two major operating restrictions that are going to cause you problems as a journalist wanting to use a drone, that is operations in controlled airspace and flight over people. I have good news and I have bad news on both of these fronts. The good news is that the FAA is moving toward automated permission to fly in controlled airspace. Currently, you're supposed to get permission from air traffic control, but the FAA has told the air traffic controllers at your local airport, don't answer the phone from these folks. Make them fill out a request on the FAA's website, and that takes up to 90 days to process. The further east you go, the longer that is. If you're on the eastern seaboard somewhere, we're talking 120, 130, 140 days before you can get permission. So City Hall is burning to the ground. You need to go to a website, fill out a form, and wait 120 days to get permission to go film City Hall burning down. That's not workable. That's absolutely not workable. There's a system coming in place called Lance. Uh, that you'll be able to pull up your smartphone, you'll be able to ping in the location you're at, such and such altitude, send off a request, and almost immediately you'll get a response back. The first 50 airports are rolling out uh, any day now. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska is actually one of them. I have spoken with the FAA several times, uh, different folks at different levels, and said, hey, if this is just sort of a a payback for that cease and desist order that they sent me, we're cool. Like, we're even now. Um, that Lincoln gets to be one of the first people to do this. Um, they have also put in uh, requests to make it an emergency that they move this automated system up because they are so overwhelmed with drone pilots filing requests to fly in controlled airspace that they can't keep up with them and the problem keeps getting worse. So they want to roll out this Lance system further, faster. Soon we will get to the point where this control, flights in controlled airspace will not be an issue. Second is flight over people. There have been two waivers issued for flight over people. Both of them have gone to CNN. The first one was a joke. It was a tethered drone 
that the FAA said they couldn't fly higher than 20 feet in the air, and CNN's internal safety policy said they couldn't fly at any lower than 16 feet. So they couldn't find a story that filled four feet of airspace. So they had the most valuable waiver, system, valuable waiver in the world, and they couldn't use it, and they never did. Just this past week, CNN got a second waiver for flight over people involving a drone that weighs about a pound. I want to say about a pound and a half. The props are enclosed, and it's made of a material that if it actually falls out of the sky and hits somebody, it'll bend and break. It'll just fall apart. And CNN has allowed, or uh, AFA has allowed them to fly that over people. They had to employ one of the best law firms in the country dealing in aviation law to get it. So don't get excited uh, about running out and getting your own. But that rock is starting to crack as well. Currently, if you want to cover a large protest with a drone, you need to find a, you need to find a spot, like a vacant lot somewhere adjacent to where that protest march is going to go through. Rope it off, fly straight up in the air, get your shot, come straight back down, and never fly over that crowd. You will see tons of video out there, particularly from the women's marches earlier this year, of drone pilots flying over those crowds. All of that stupid, not allowed, unsafe, irresponsible. And I will pin a fair amount of the responsibility on local television news, on local news organizations that took that drone video from those local pilots and used it. There is an ethical consideration to be considered there. That is, if you use drone video that was illegally shot and is visibly unsafe, what responsibility do you have for promoting that, for making others think it's OK? It's not. Second problem we're going to run to are actually state and local governments. The FAA has moved so slow on this that state and local governments have gotten in the game. Some of them are actively hostile to the Constitution. In the state of Texas right now, if you take a photograph with a drone above eight feet in the air of private property without permission of that property owner and you publish it, you're a misdemeanor criminal. So if I go to Dallas, Texas, and I fly nine feet in the air and I take a picture of the downtown Dallas skyline, a photograph that's been taken a million times before, but because I shot it with a drone at nine feet in the air and I publish that without getting permission of every visible landowner in the frame, I'm a misdemeanor criminal in the state of Texas. Number of people who have been prosecuted under this law, zip. Prosecutors know this is a stupid law, that it would die a quick death in a court challenge. I have been asked many times by lawyers, please go to Texas. Please violate this law. Please get arrested. I'm sort of at the point in my life and my career where, eh, you know, day in the pokey wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> but as I've said to them, I'll do it if I get to pick the jail. I'm going to pick me the most rural country jail possible where I can just take a nice rest, maybe read a book, not really have to worry. Um, state rules uh, also have tried to add drones to their privacy regulations. A lot of that is just making illegal things more illegal. It's actually putting a lot of states in the position of being in an arms race with technology, which is a bad idea. Local rules have tried to ban drones from public parks, from taking off and landing on public places. The way that I sort of sum this up for a lot of people is your drone is in federally regulated airspace. The FAA asserts jurisdiction over all air above the ground. Your ass is in somebody's jurisdiction. So what you're doing on the ground, there is some ground for them to control that. States and municipalities that try to control what goes on in the air are running afoul of federal preemption. And you're going to see lots and lots and lots of lawsuits about all of this. Speaking of lawsuits, journalists are pioneers in the drone game. We are the ones who are out there. We are in areas that are very unsettled of law. The idea that you own some segment of the air above your property is generally recognized, but we don't know where that line stops. We don't know what is generally considered yours versus federally regulated airspace. We don't know about, even the idea of photographing police in public is not a clearly defined legal right. 
And when you put a drone, or we put a camera on a drone, and actually the camera is no longer a part of you, it's flying somewhere else, where do the First Amendment lines get drawn? We don't know. We honestly don't know. I could talk to you for another hour and a half about the history of aviation law and how absolutely weird it is, and how we are now in 2017, and there are questions about photographing things from airplanes that we just flat out don't know. And by the way, we've been flying airplanes since 1903. Um, there's going to be lawsuits over this. Journalists are going to be a part of those. And the next 10 years are going to be really interesting when it comes to First Amendment law. I am almost out of time, but I want to show you just a couple of things, sort of talk about where this is going. Um, I have said all along that it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to put a camera on a flying thing and find it to be useful. Um, but we can do more than just simple photographs and video. Mapping, we can begin to map things. This is a park just down the block from my office. This was done in, um, this was done in 2014 before we had any licenses to do this. So this is not actually a drone doing this. This is a nine foot wide kite. We got a kite because a kite is not a federally regulated aircraft. We hung a camera from it and we flew it around the park. Now a nine foot wide kite on a Midwestern spring day was enough for me to dig my feet into the ground, wrap the string around my arm three times and lean back and it would hold up my body weight. I'm 100, uh, at the time I was about a 175 pound guy and I'm just sitting there surfing that thing. It cut through the gloves and my hand. Uh, it was not a good day in class that day. But we can take this, we can put it in software, and we can build extraordinarily high resolution maps on demand. This is now easily capable in drones uh, with freely available software on your phone. You get a, a piece of software called Drone Deploy. You draw a little rectangle around where you want to go, Drone Deploy goes out, figures out exactly how wide it needs to fly in order to cover that whole area. And you can build not only a map of that area, but you can build three-dimensional objects in there. You can build a complete three-dimensional model of Antelope Valley Park here. Now, we have taken this model and put it into virtual reality. Um, because we didn't do any ground-based photography, all of the vertical surfaces look like they're melting. So we have described this as what Antelope Valley Park will look like after it is nuked off the face of the earth. Walking around is sort of this dystopian thing. But one of my former students and one of Dan Pacheco's current or former, where are you Dan? Is he still there? Um, put this together, which is made of almost a thousand drone photos of an archaeological dig site. And what you're looking at is what somebody sees in virtual reality. This is the, they just recorded what somebody was doing. This is a, an ancient Roman city. It was founded uh, after Caesar Augustus got sick and tired of a pirate haven being there. So he wiped it out, slaughtered the pirates, and then built a town on top of it. These tiles here, this Roman mosaic, are some of the largest intact Roman mosaics anywhere outside of Rome. Um, and if you are actually standing where this person in virtual reality is standing, the in Turkish interior ministry would like to put you in a deep, dark cell somewhere. You can't actually walk here. But using virtual reality, we can let people walk through these places. Imagine using this same technology in Puerto Rico right now, going and imaging an entire village in virtual reality in, at sub-centimeter levels of accuracy and letting somebody walk through it and experience what that village looks like from the ground as they walk. It is imminently possible with the technology that we currently have. And I think that is, to borrow a hockey expression, that's where the puck's going, is we'll begin to build much more immersive experiences out of these things. I think I am right up on time but if you've got any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them now. Hot. 
Very good. Uh, so I work for the Chicago Tribune. We have two drones and four people licensed. If you're familiar with the city of Chicago's drone ordinances, which they passed in November of 2015, they're among, I think, the nation's strictest. Yes. I could read you some of them between dusk and dawn, bad weather, can't go over a school, can't get near a, a like trans. I mean, basically, there is literally no place in the city of Chicago that we can actually fly our drones in application. Do you know, as other cities and towns move to... Um, uh, ordinances this strict of any ongoing or pending legal challenges? Because we were actually debating what we should do to challenge some of this, because this seems like a huge overstep and completely limits what we can do with these devices. Who the living crap out of them. And the thing you want to look for is a, is a federal lawsuit called City, uh, uh, City of Newtown, Massachusetts. I'm trying to remember the, the plaintiff in that case. Um, but City of Newtown, look, look up that and, and, and what that lawsuit did, they did, the, they did the exact same thing where they basically tried to ban drone flight over their community. Hmm. A local, I want to say he's a doctor, uh, who was a drone hobbyist, sued the city and the, had their drone ordinance tossed out in federal court based entirely on this issue of federal preemption. There are places for cities and states even to regulate some of this stuff under sort of general health, safety, and welfare um, areas of law. There is a state interest in these things. But when it gets to you can't fly between these hours and you can't fly under these parameters, that is absolutely the FAA's territory. Uh, and you can get that knocked out relative. I mean, I mean it's going to cost you a bunch of money to hire lawyers and do that. But that's. We have lawyers. That, yeah, I was going to say. What are they doing right now? Nothing. I mean, let's get them working here. Um, you know, get them, get them earn those billable hours. Um, there, that's the court was very receptive to those areas where there is no clear state interest that it very clearly crossed into the regulatory domain of the FAA. The there were like eight parts of that city of Newtown ordinance and this guy sued on six of them and the two that remain he said well that's that's legit so um the city of newtown just appealed yesterday to a higher court but that initial ruling is not binding uh anywhere outside of the state of massachusetts but it's precedent setting and it's very useful and it provides a guide and I think a lot of news organizations, to, to sort of branch this out from just the city of Chicago, a lot of news organizations have been asleep at the switch. Their state governments, their city councils have been passing these drone ordinances and they haven't realized that they're cutting off their own ability to do anything with these things. So if you want to use a drone to do anything, you had best get active in your broadcasting associations, your, uh, your press associations, your lobbying organizations in the state and in the city. You need to be following these things, and you need to recognize that when cities and states move in to try to limit this, they are limiting your ability to use a tool to cover news. Um, a couple, a combined um, question along that. So I'm assuming there are, um, you know, the, the press is allowed to roll up satellite trucks and park in certain places that nobody else can park to cover an event in a way that the public can't. Are there ways for the city to allow the media to get special privileges to use drones to cover newsworthy events without opening the floodgates for every hobbyist with a drone? And then on the flip side of that, what is the real fear that's driving this? Is it privacy or safety or a bit of both? I'll take the second one first. The answer is yes. It is it, it, really it's whatever could get me reelected. There's a lot of really bad legislation that is being put out there that they're banging a gong that doesn't really exist. Um, you know, I could have somebody peering in my windows. The number of cases in the world where that's gone on is very few. Um, drone pilots are not buying drones to go out and peer in windows. Um, we've had cases where people claimed that their, you know, the drone pilot was flying, you know, 10 feet above their sunbathing daughter in the backyard. So they busted out the shotgun and shot it out of the sky. The video and telemetry from the drone that was retrieved showed that it was over the neighbor's property and was 120 feet in the air. There's a lot of fear mongering that's going on to drive it. Is it private property? Yeah. Is it privacy? Yes. Is it safety? 
the Canadian uh, transport minister, uh, who is an actual astronaut, uh, is terrified of drones because he thinks they're going to bring down a plane. Well, Canada just actually had the first known contact between a drone and a commercial airliner, and nothing happened. It barely scratched the paint. So uh, Canada went in and passed, they, they went in and under emergency rules passed a ton of super restrictive drone rules out of the clear blue sky and then sprung them on everybody. Canada used to be a libertarian paradise when it came to flying drones, and now it's, unless you're a Canadian and you've got, already got a license, forget it. Forget it. There are a lot of American drone pilots used to go up into Canada and shoot stuff for like Nat Geo and Discovery and places like that. They've stopped. They quit. Um, now I forgot what your first question was. Uh, the, uh, the yes. Um, so this is uncomfortable for me because I don't believe media should get special carve outs for things. The First Amendment applies to everybody. Um, currently under rules regarding temporary flight restrictions, the FAA says properly accredited media can get permission to fly in a TFR. One, who is media anymore? Two, what does properly accredited mean? And since freaking when does the FAA get to decide who that is? That is anathema to a free press. The government deciding who is media and who isn't is anathema to a free press. So I'm deeply uncomfortable with that sort of set aside idea. Now, the truth of the matter is that goes on all the time. Um, the thing that we, the thing that, so I've gone around over the last year and done these drone boot camps around the country, and we've, between the one in Lincoln and the four that I've done with the Pointer Institute, we've trained almost 400 journalists in how this, how this is done. What I tell them all is, first thing you do when you get back is schedule a meeting with your law enforcement, with your fire and rescue folk, and just say, we're going to be out there, we're going to be covering these things, we're going to have a drone, how do we work together? Don't ask for permission, say, we're going to be there because you have a right to be there. But adults have conversations about how do we do this and not, how do, how do we as media do this without getting in the way of like active firefighting efforts, you know, attempts to save people's lives? How do we, how do we not interfere with you know, active SWAT calls, you know, hostage situations, things like that? Like we need to be able to talk about these things and not step on each other's toes. That said, we have a First Amendment mission. We have a right to be there. We have a right to be able to photograph these things. The FAA says we can fly these drones in these places at these times. This is not arguable. You don't get to say no. But eh, like I said, adults have conversations. And that's a great place to stop. Um, so let's thank, thank Matt Waite.